All right. So let's see. Yay. All right. So what we're going to do today is, is this is our agenda, okay? And I'm sorry, I don't want to get in his way. Um, the first is we're going to examine what we call the secrets of success relative to sales. Um, we're going to review a personal framework for goals and a business plan that are easy to use and that will actually motivate you. And you're going to build it around your own business, not something that I tell you to do. And then we're going to discuss and develop a mindset for success, goal setting, how to, how to develop your simple business plan, and then disciplines. I mean, the great thing is having trained and coached salespeople for all these decades, it's pretty easy. I always tell people it's simple, not easy, okay? A lot of, a lot of really bona fide disciplines and secrets of success, if you will, but not always easy to implement, right? Okay. Let's see. Am I working? Hmm. This is not progressing now. In any way, shape, or form. The whole thing is frozen. Rach, can you hear me? Yes. For, for some reason, the I think the I think we're frozen. We're not progressing here. Okay. Help. <laughs> Let's try. That's not a great way to have to look at it, but if this is the way we've got to do it. Hmm. I'm sorry, guys. All right, I think we got it again now, so let's see. All right, so again, Thanks so much for, um, thank you. So, you know, a lot of times I actually meet resistance from salespeople about having to set goals or write a business plan. And, and this is the story I like to tell everybody. So for 26 years, I owned and operated a large mortgage company here in Connecticut. And my husband is a commercial banker. And, you know, as such, he is evaluating businesses all the time. And as part of his responsibilities, he would review a, a company's business plan. So he made me write a 29-page business plan when I opened my mortgage company, which went into my drawer, okay? And I found it 26 years later when I just decided to merge my company into prime lending. I had never looked at it once after that. It was, a, it was a, as far as I'm concerned, a dead document. What we want to make sure that you have is very clear goals and a business plan that serves you, that's going to motivate you to take it out and review it. And here's some of the statistics that are so compelling. Written goal setters are nine times more than those who don't, okay? Nine times. We're just talking earning. You're self-employed people, right? I think you're probably doing this because you want to make money. And I'm going to go out on a limb and say you probably are going to do this because you want to make more money. So written goal setters are nine times. It's almost 10 times. 80% of Americans don't have goals. 16% do, but they're not written down, and less than 4% have written goals. And of that, only less than 1% review them daily. So to the extent that you can put a daily discipline where you're looking at your goals and you're reviewing your business plan, your chances just by that act alone increase your probability of earning nine times more than your, than your fellow real estate agents. That's a pretty compelling statistic. Okay. I always say that sales success has four key ingredients, okay? And I know it's kind of weird to see happiness on the top of that list, but I'm going to talk to you a lot about happiness and what I call and what we know to be what's called the happiness advantage, okay? Number two, I don't care what anybody says. It takes hard work. I really don't know anybody who said, yeah, I'm, an, I'm just an overnight sensation and, uh, you know, kind of fell into it and all worked out for me. Yeah. Started in real estate. I sold 89 houses. 
first year, all I did was kind of like put a quick little post up. Like that. I don't care like that. All right. Three determination. You have it, it's just I pulled through all the different ingredients of all the successful people that I trained and coached over the years. And I'm telling you, it came down to these four things. And number four, adaptability. Adaptability. You've got to be able to adapt. I'll tell a quick story. When Alan and I were doing this training course in 2018 and 2019, I used to stand up here and say to new agents, we're in a buyer's market. When we convert to a seller's market, and we will, you're going to wish you were never born. And they all laughed and thought it was ridiculous. But I, to this day, all through 2020, 21, I got calls from agents who were in this program saying, oh my God, I remember you telling me that when I converted to a seller's market, I was going to wish I was never born. You know what? That was so true. You have to be adaptable, right? Because what a seller's market looks like in real estate is very different from a buyer's market. What the market looks like for me when rates are two and three quarters percent versus seven and a half percent is very, very different. So we've got to constantly be adaptable. We'll talk a little bit more about that in, in a little bit. So here's what I want you to know. I am one of those people that if I find something interesting, I sign up for every course or anything that I can learn about. So went to a Tony Robbins training session once. What did I do? I became a certified Tony Robbins trainer, which means you have to do all the Tony Robbins courses and then go through Trainers Academy. Did you do that too? I didn't know you started that, but I didn't. Yeah, okay. So I was like, this is great. Now, Tony Robbins, yeah. Tony Robbins brings up usually a lot, a lot of people get really negative when they hear about Tony Robbins because, you know, it's, he's like intense and he's rah, rah, and he is. And, but he, it served me at a really important part in my time in my life where I was, because when I was really trying to grow my business and I wanted to develop a particular success mindset and nobody does that better than Tony Robbins. But what Tony didn't teach you in those days, that might be different now, is what a lot of the science, until you got to Trainers Academy, the Training Academy, he didn't really teach you the true science and um, psychology that went behind a lot of his teachings. And as a result, people tend to chalk him up as like airy fair, right? Like, oh, he's just a rah-rah guy. He's just a motivational guy. It's easy to discount that. Well, fast forward to four years ago, five years ago, I was in training with you guys, with you and Wojcik. Barbara brought in a speaker who, the, um, the guy from um, Ninja Sales, remember? Mm -hmm. And he was doing the thing. And remember he showed the video clip of Sean Aker at um, doing the TED Talk? So you may or may not remember this. Now, I listened to this. I've been in the business at this point, I don't know, 35 years. I was mesmerized by this guy. I walk out of the Pierce meeting where I was doing training with them. And... Um, I was like, I have to know everything possible about this guy, Sean Aker. Sean Aker is a psychologist who wrote a book called The Happiness Advantage. If you don't do anything that I teach you in the next two hours, please, please, please download it, buy it, do whatever you have to do to try to listen to what he's talking about. For two years, I kid you not, you want to talk about daily disciplines for success? Back in the days when I would commute to an office, I listened to his book for two years straight. What? Oh, okay. Yeah, I think Rach was handling that, but let me. Thanks, Alan. So I listened to him every day for two years. Every day for two years. Now I'm going to tell you a story. After when 2000 came, we were all remote, right? And I was no I found a real gap in my mindset. We were also working 17 hour days. But all of a sudden I realized how important it was that I had been listening to him every day. Let me tell you why I think he's so important for you to understand. He's a, he's a, uh, he's a psychologist who came out of Harvard. And what basically they, he was studying was this emerging field of positive psychology, okay? Now we know psychology, we're usually treating an ailment or an illness, right? But what this new emerging field of um, psycho positive psychology is all about is like, how do you, what is, what are we capable of from a performance standpoint, peak performance when our minds are in the right place? Okay. And that's, that sounds again, a little, well, what they did is they took a look at 200 studies over 275,000 people. Now, if you know anything about psych studies, you're usually dealing with a really small data sample, right? My daughter is a psychiatric nurse practitioner. 
So I, I know a lot about psych studies and psychology studies. This is a monstrous met, called meta study on the field of positive psychology. They looked at employees, CEOs, students, and nuns. I'm gonna talk about the nuns in a minute. What they basically saw was those people who had developed positive psychology mindsets and positive psychology life skills experienced greater success exponentially and often lived longer, like lived longer. So this one of the studies that he cites is this study, they found the journals of a cloister nun, of a, of a convent of cloistered nuns. And in this particular convent, they were required to journal every single day. So what the psychologists did when they found this, right, is they started looking at the nuns who were, who were journaling in a positive manner and those who weren't. And the nuns that were journaling in a positive manner outlived their counterparts by 10 years. 10 years. Talk about a controlled study, right? They're all eating the same thing. They're all getting the same exercise. They're all praying together. I mean, you're talking about a very, very controlled study. So it was really kind of an amazing amount of affirmation about why this is so important. Um, what they found, what we found is optimistic salespeople outsell their counterparts by 56%. I don't know about you, got an inventory shortage right now. Do we usually see more than one realtor trying to get a listing at any given time? Just having a little bit of competition out there, right? Now think about what's going on in the market right now. There's a lot of reasons that you could develop perhaps a negative mindset. Oh my God, interest rates went up catastrophic. There is no inventory. Catastrophic. Home prices balloon. If that's the way you're approaching this with buyers, you're going to struggle. You're going to struggle, right? But having an optimistic mindset. Now, what's really important to me is I've always had an optimistic mindset and I've worked really hard to develop it and hone it and become a master at it. But every once in a while, somebody would accuse me of being a polyamory, at which point I got really angry. Like there was my positive mindset out the window. And here's what I want to say is, I, I, it's not a Pollyanna, it's not a Pollyanna mindset. To me, when you have an optimistic mindset, it means it's about being realistic about the present. We have an inventory crisis. Mortgage rates are going up. But what's the future look like? What's going to happen in the future? And am I optimistic about the future? That to me is what an optimist is. It's not somebody who's unrealistic or doesn't think there's any problems in the world. It's somebody who acknowledges what the reality is and comes up with positive, proactive solutions and approaches accordingly. Does that make sense? Yes. Oh. It's so funny. It, then all of a sudden it times out on me. Let's try this. I'm just pressing all sorts of buttons here. The clicker wasn't working. Uh, this, this is the Alan. Do you do you um? I know that I did that before. Oh, there we go. Okay, this time works. All right. So let me tell you something I learned in the Happiness Advantage, which is something that's called the the ten five Ritz Carlton rule. If you work for the Ritz Carlton, you're trained that if you're within ten feet of anybody on the property, you must smile. And if you're within five feet, you must say hello. It sounds like such a simple, silly thing, right? Well, what Sean Aker found when they started studying this is that in a landmark study, medical providers who focused on smiling increased the positive outcome of the patient by 24%. Now, here's what I want to tell you. I thought this was the coolest thing I ever, I ever saw. My daughter, as I told you, is in Yale is a site nurse practitioner. I can tell you guys, because she's not here and I can brag on her, she went to Yale, okay? She doesn't let me tell anybody when I'm around her, but I tell anybody who'll listen to me that my daughter got to go to Yale, full ride to Yale. We're talking about a really bright, energetic young woman. When she started working at Yale, they trained her on this. They trained her on this. So I was so thrilled. So again, you can talk about being positive and Tony Robbins, you know, airy fairy, new age, whatever, but the science, this is science that's 
proving and meting out the importance of having the right mindset. So I, I always tell people, I like to give you a 30 day challenge and the 30 day challenge is just, and I'm gonna give you what the happiness advantage looks like at the end. Um, I encourage you to try the, I'm gonna tell you what the happiness advantage practices are at the end. I would encourage you to try it for 30 days. I guarantee you, there's not much I can guarantee in life. I have two right now. One is if you practice the happiness advantage and the principles of it for 30 days, you will see more success. And two, interest rates will be coming back down. Those are the only two things I can guarantee you. Okay. All right. So let's talk about these three items. Work ethic, WIT. So I love, I, I, because I have always been a voracious student of peak performance and understanding a positive mindset, anybody who crossed my path who possessed this, I was like, I wanted to know all about it. So I had a landlord when I owned my mortgage company, I had a really wonderful landlord, very successful, very wealthy. And every time I met him, his name is Steve Roberts, um, he would walk in and he had a gold lapel pin, W-I-T, every time. I never saw him without this pin. Now, his name is Steve Roberts, so I know it's not his monocle. Plan. So finally one day I'm like, Steve, I got it. Like, what's, what's WIT? And he said, whatever it takes. He said, that's my set. Every morning I get up, put my pin on, and today I'm going to do whatever it takes to meet my goals and meet my objectives. I was like, wow, that's absolutely fantastic. I absolutely love that. And a lot of times I, when I'm talking with like my loan officers who work for me now and whatnot, I'll be like, are you doing whatever it takes? Are you willing? Are you willing? to do whatever it takes? That's the most first and most important question. Because if the answer is no, it's okay, but you gotta then kind of set your expectations accordingly, right? Two, determination. I would say you've gotta be relentless in your pursuit and relentless is a very specific key word that I use. You need to be relentless. Two, you need to get comfortable with being outside your comfort zone. I still have loan officers who say to me, Gonna do social media. I don't like this. I want to look food on some. I'm like, okay. Well, your competition's gonna eat you for lunch then. So you know, you and I said this to one of my senior loan officers the other day. I was like, you have got to get comfortable and get outside your comfort zone. That's so so important. Call reluctance. You as salespeople have to understand that call reluctance shows up in many many ways in many ways, and it is a real thing. And even for the most seasoned salespeople like myself, call reluctance shows up. Now you can be like flat out, like, oh, I'm not making 10 calls today. I'm not doing it. That's pretty obvious, call reluctance. But it's insidious, and it shows up in little places like, oh, I'm so sorry. I have to take care of this contract right now, and I've got to get busy with all my busy work and not make the calls that are necessary to progress my business forward. And you can convince yourself for a really long time that you're doing the right thing. But you're going to wind up, what I call them the um, boa constrictor salespeople, right? Mm -hmm. Meaning you have a bigger pipeline that you got from making your sales calls and doing your sales and business activities. You have your pipeline. Now you focus only on your pipeline. You don't do your sales. And what happens? The snake um, that ate the mouse. It's sitting in his stomach, then he digests it, and you have no pipeline. You go back to building your pipeline. It's, it's, a, it's a vicious circle, and it's so common for salespeople. So you want to develop disciplines and daily practices that force you to do the work that's going to develop the opportunities for you so that you don't wind up in this up and down situation. And we see it all the time. You have to be brutally honest in your assessment. Brutally honest. You know, if you're not on the only person you're cheating by not being brutally honest is yourself and perhaps your family, if they're financially responsible on you to earn an income. So being brutally honest is really important. Adaptability, you have to be insatiable. You see somebody, I see Anna doing something right. I, you, I talk to realtors all the time. Oh my God, I can't believe you're able to do this. Alexa, I told Alexis, like how many times did I compliment you on your social media work? Constantly, when I first met her, I'm like, wow, you're doing a great job. I need to know more about this. Have I done it? No, nope, I haven't done it, full disclosure, but I'm paying attention to people who are doing things really, really well. Okay. That won't work. This, 
This to me, if anybody that works for me uses those words, they need to run fast away from me because I'm going to throw something at them. So it's not uncommon that we hear that Linda is doing something really successful. And maybe one of my salespeople or I start to do it. And now it's not working for us. It's just not working for us. So what do we do? We go, that doesn't work. No, we're not being brutally honest with ourselves about are, are we doing something different than the way she's doing it? Are we, are we not bringing our best energy to the activity? Do we not like doing it? And therefore, we're saying it doesn't work. But I always say, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. If you're trying, if I'm going to start trying to do video on social media, it's like, you know, I need to get over myself, right? I mean, so many of you are doing a great job with this. I, I, I get there and I'm like, oh, like I had a hair here. I needed, I said, um, once, right? You start picking yourself apart. And next thing you know, you're like, oh, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. No, it's not, it, it doesn't work. I'm not working. I'm not working it right. You've got to be so open-minded to this. Um, and again, remember the baby. You don't want to ever throw the baby out with the bath water. Kelly, can I share? Yes, please. So years ago, when I was in Kelly's course, and I learned about the Ritz Carlton uh, theory, it was like amazing, mind blowing. Because I was like, oh, I kind of do that, but there's a lot of opportunities, but I don't think of it. So for years, I have a six year old son, and we go on walks during the warmer months. And so we made a rule that every time a car drives by, we have to smile and wave to it. And it's like a rule. And now, not everyone smiles and waves back. So it's very easy to get like discouraged about it. And then when you were touching upon call reluctance, like there are times where we don't smile and wave. And that's like that little insidious way of like call reluctance because it's like wave reluctance, right? And then we kind of like process it and we're asking ourselves, like, what me and the six year old, why are we not doing it? Because we're getting discouraged from all of them. Correct. But like it's like those little tiny things because when I'm doing those things in the morning, that's when I get in the It's your day. It's I'm more your prone day. to sit to Correct. make that extra. Correct. But I learned it from that Ritz Carlton thing, and I just rewrote it because I honestly forgot about it. And now that you said it, I'm like, ah, oh. yeah, that's where it came from. Yeah. It's so cool. It's really so cool. Like I said, when my daughter, when I realized that Yale is is training their medical professionals, their doctors, their nurse practitioners, their nurses to do this, it's pretty compelling, right? It's pretty compelling. So we're gonna go over goal. We're gonna talk about how you set your goal. Right. How are you going to set your 2023 goal? We're going to talk about emotional leverage, what the goal is, and the income calculation worksheet. So this is kind of the nitty gritty of it. All right. So the first thing I want to say to you is this. The most powerful thing that I learned from Tony Robbins was that, excuse me, with success, you have a greater chance of having success if you have, emo if you have applied emotional leverage to your goal. So let's just say somebody in this room says, you know, I make $100,000. I like that number. It's kind of big. It's six figures. It's kind of cool. And that's the end. That's the end of it. You may, you may do it. You know, if you possess kind of a natural personality for this, but I'm going to tell you something right now. If you can apply emotional leverage, we call it anchoring, to that goal, your chances of increasing it are exponentially higher. And what do I mean by this? Why this figure? Why? You have to ask yourself this question. You've got to be real. Why, why is it 100,000? What is it about 100,000? Then you go deeper. Well, why is it really important to me? Digging deeper with the naked truth. But why? What? So I'm going to tell you something. Every year, I do this exercise every year. I've been doing this for 25 years. I'm going to tell you what my, you know, you'll hear this also called your why. And that's nice that they call it your why. But you, you really need to, like, get really personal and and naked, if you will, with yourself about why it's your why. So here's the thing. I am the most unhappy empty nester you will ever meet. My three kids are my favorite, and their spouses are my favorite human beings in the entire world. They're grown. One of my sons has two grandchildren. I have two children. I have two little grandchildren. They have their own lives. So what does that mean for an unhappy empty nester? I don't get to see them as much as I want, right? So I have a, a monstrous income goal every year. It's big, okay? And my why, when I, and I go through this every time, and it hasn't changed for a number of years, is, and some of you have heard me say this before, is I want to be able to spend, I want to be able to pay for two vacations a year where I pay for my entire family, they don't have to come out of pocket for a dime, to go on vacation with me. And then I get them. 
to myself for two <laughs> solid weeks. Okay. And this happened. And, and ever since I set that goal five years ago, I've accomplished it every single year. And we've done two vacations. And they were so excited about it last year. They were like, can't we buy someplace in Vermont and just come skiing every, every weekend? Yeah, we can do that. So we did my goals. It was like, now I bought a place in Vermont. They're going to come up every weekend with me to ski. I will work my, I will work to my fingers are bloody to get that income goal, to have that experience. Does that make sense, right? A lot of times the income goal is around financial security. Sometimes it's about financial freedom. Other people would tell you, oh, think about a car you wanna buy. Think about some, and those are lovely and wonderful. I'm not saying that some of us aren't motivated by, you know, a Louis Vuitton bag or a bigger, better, more beautiful car. So it does work for some people. For me though, and in my experience, those, those salespeople who can get really anchored into that emotional, you know, in my younger years, it was that I wanted my kids to be able to go to any college of their choice and not have to worry about the money. And we accomplished that. We accomplished that. A lot easier to work a 10-hour day when you're really clear about why you're doing it. Does that make sense? Okay. How badly do I want it? Do you guys think I want what I want really badly? Like, I'm pretty compelling, right? It's, it's really, really important to me. And what am I really willing to do to get it? I will do whatever it takes whatever it takes to get it. So you ask yourself those questions. And then I want you to start thinking five years out. And guys, after this um, session's over, I'm gonna email this, this presentation to you guys. So you'll have it, especially when we get to the worksheet. Everybody usually gets nervous because you want to. I'm gonna send this all to you this afternoon. So you'll have it, okay? So you wanna start thinking about what would it look like five years from now? What's the, my income number? Because you're new agents, newer agents, where I would be feeling like, yeah, I did it. I'm successful. I accomplished a big goal. Sometimes, I, if anybody ever read the book by Jim Collins, Good to Great, has anybody ever read that book? He, he said something which is set a big, hairy, audacious goal. They call them BHAGs, which is basically set a number that like makes you go hard. You know, whether if that's something that motivates you, that might be the way you do it. And then you have to build to it, right? Because you you can determine what your income goal is this year, but it's always more compelling um, if you've got your five-year plan in place, okay? So you'll go through that exercise. So you're gonna be, what we're gonna do is we're gonna begin with an income goal. And what I tell everybody is you wanna use statistics when we're, when we're developing this. I'm gonna show you how to do it from your current year. Now, if you don't have, how many people here are really new, new? Okay. So if you don't have statistics, then what I want you to do is talk with your broker or talk with another agent in your office, maybe who's been doing this for a year or two. Now, your statistics are going to be, statistics this year are going to be a little skewed because of market conditions, right? And we're in a changing market, but that never stopped anybody from being successful. I lived through the subprime mortgage crisis, okay? This is, this is difficult. These changing market times right now are difficult, but I... I went through the subprime mortgage crisis and I never wrote a subprime mortgage. So I got this, like we got this, right? But you've got to, you've got to use, I'd have, you'll see what I mean by statistics in a minute. And you're going to, we're going to drill down so that you, that you'll be able to walk out of doing this plan for yourself, knowing how many leads, leads you need to have each day in order to meet your goal. Because we're going to go into conversion ratios on all of it. I tell everybody, downgrade your numbers. If if you think you if you if you think you're you're not I'm not sure if my average sales price is 250 or 350. Say 250. Downgrade your numbers because the only person you're cheating if you go too high is yourself. And if you downgrade them, you're gonna you're gonna do more than what you want to do. Okay, and that's always a better place to be. We're gonna break out things by referral sources, and now let's take a quick look at the sample. Okay, so I did an example. It's harder for me in real estate, for real estate, because I'm not a realtor, but basically said, okay, if somebody wants to be, um, wants to earn $100,000 next year, and their average commission per side is $5,000, all right, then that means they need to close 20 sides a year or two a month. Right. That's again, you guys know what your average commission is on, on a loan. And everybody's different in real estate. You know, it used to be I could I could take one and a half percent per side, but those days are gone, right? So 
that's how you get to how many how many closings you need. How many closings per side do you need to get to 100,000? Two. Average site price in 2022, let's say it was 250, which then means, and you see, I give you the math on how to do it, that you need to close $5 million, if these are all your numbers, in 2023 to get to $100,000. But what's your closing, your contract to closing ratio? Anybody here do a deal last year that didn't close? You have to know that number. And when you're newer in the business, I hate to tell you, your, your fallout ratio tends to be higher than when you're a little bit more experienced, okay? But, you know, home inspection, anybody have somebody pull out of a deal because of a home inspection? Anybody, God help us, lose a deal because the mortgage lender didn't do their job? Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's reasons why. Deal how about, how about, is anybody else feeling the way I am right now? I'm seeing so much buyer's remorse in the market right now. Like it's like a whiplash effect to what's going on the last two years. You know, some buyer. I have never seen as many people pulling out of contracts day two, three, and four because all of a sudden they're like, nope, 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 don't want to do it. So you've got to you've got to know what that pull through ratio is. So eighty. Let's say it's eighty percent. That means you, this person needs 25 contracts to get to the 20 closings to get to the 100,000. Does that make sense? What's your lead to contract conversion ratio? How many people do you who are actively looking to buy or sell houses do you need to talk to to get, to get the deal? This is such an important number. And it's one that a lot of people don't spend time looking at. So I'll tell you a story about it. When I decided to really drill down on this with my very seasoned loan officer staff, most of my loan officers are like, oh, mine's 80%. I, I get 80% of the deals. 80% of the people I talk to come to me. And I knew where that was coming from. See, because they were automatically skimming through all the people they talked to who didn't qualify. They were only thinking like you had a qualified buyer but you didn't lose them to the competition. That's what that's what they were thinking about. They weren't thinking about all the other people that they talked to. So I have one loan officer who really took this to heart, very seasoned, highly respected, up in my up in the New London market. He still works for me. He's talked to him on the way over. He's a great guy. His was 40%. 40%. My other loan officers challenged him. And they're like, dude, start thinking about all the people you talk to. And 40, well, it's, we'll talk about true lead conversion, like Zillow, Realtor.com leads. That's a whole different animal, right? So if you're working in that area of the business, you're you're considered growing success at 10? Two now. Two. Two percent conversion. Two percent conversion. How many people do you have to talk to, right? You better, you better. I mean, I listen, it's a very viable great way for realtors to develop business, but you, you have to have your SHIT together to do that kind of business, right? If you're doing belly to belly business, like referral based business, not true lead gen, 40% is what our senior people see. You're looking at 25% probably if you're newer. So what does that mean? That means you need a hundred leads a year, nine a month. And again, this is not lead gen. I'm not, you can plug and play your lead gen numbers into this. Two a week, one a day, one a day, one, one lead per day. Now you could call any of my loan officers and ask them how many leads they need a day. They're going to tell you. So that's a different mindset, right? That's like, how do I get to 100,000 by the end of the year? I got one lead a day. If all my numbers are right, if my conversion and pull through numbers are right, I need one lead a day in this, in this scenario. That's pretty compelling. That's a pretty compelling number about how you're going to set up your day and how you're going to set up your disciplines. Would you agree? I know Alan's thought about it this way, and I know Linda has been in my class before. Well, has anybody else ever looked at it quite this way? One lead, oh, because you were in my class too. One, I mean, you, when you adopt that mindset, your whole day plan changes. I mean, I know people that I've coached who are like, I can't, I cannot leave work until I get my one lead. I can't do it. I cannot go home until I have my one lead because I'm cheating myself and I'm cheating my family. And that's where call reluctance, you start saying, 
oh my God, I had to work to find a lead till eight o'clock at night if I had just done this better. And that's where that brutal assessment, that really radical honesty that you're with yourself, you'll start to become a master at time management and daily practice management so that you'll get to that success. Does, does this all make sense? Cool. Okay. And I'm going to send you blank worksheets so you can work them up yourself. And those of you who want to do them in Excel, you have a good time putting them in Excel because I've never done that. We still do them by hand because I don't know, there's something so satisfying about writing it down. Okay, the second thing you're going to do, so that's going to be your income goal. That's your income goal. Now, what we want you to evaluate before we set up your business plan is where are you going to get it? So let's say you have to get one lead per day. If you've been in the business, if you've been doing business, you can go back and you should be ruthless about keeping track about where your referrals are coming from. Ruthless, okay? Database management at this stage in your careers can literally make or break you from being a rock star real estate agent. Question is, do you want to spin your wheels over and over and over again? Or do you want to deepen and engage yourself within that database so that all of a sudden that database is a living, breathing referral machine for you? And we're going to talk a lot about how to do that in a little bit, but you absolutely positively have have to be relentless at tracking where you're getting your leads from, okay? My loan officers know at any point in time where they got their business from. So let's talk about kind of common, common places realtors get business today. Am I in the way? Oh, I thought I was in, in, in front of, okay, no. So number one, sphere of influence. Now, when you start, I'm sure somebody told you, you know, you need to let everybody you know, know you're in real estate. You guys are coming up on your first, maybe some of you are going to be at your first Christmas. I always say this is the worst feeling in the world when you go to a Christmas party and you see somebody that you know and they go, oh my God, we bought a house this year. <laughs> you're like, congratulations. <laughs> oh, I forgot, I forgot, you were, I forgot you were a mortgage lender. I should have called you. Okay, so who is your sphere of influence? How are you marketing to them? Social media today makes this so much easier, okay? Because if you are, if you're being really good at adding all your contacts into your social media platforms and you have a consistent approach in social media, it's kind of hard for them to forget you. They still will. I don't think social media solves it completely. It's a big help, but I wouldn't rely strictly on social media for that work. And that's the kind of stuff Alan's talking about in his training classes, et cetera. I always call it the ultimate wedding list. If you could invite, eh, you had no financial budget, who would you invite to your wedding, right? Like those are the people that you need to be hitting on multiple ways, multiple methods, multiple approaches so that they don't forget that you're in real estate, okay? I have one of my favorite realtors, she's, she's not selling real estate anymore. I love this story. She got pulled over for speeding by a cop. She sold him a house in his <laughs> Like that's town, you know, that's really town. Um, B2B, business to business, you know, are you working with attorneys? Are you working with accountants, financial planners, mortgage lenders, builders, contractors? We know some people in real estate and in mortgage lending who are wildly successful because of their church relationships, okay? If you haven't seen Jamika Jeffries come in here and talk about what goes on for her, I mean, there's some really, really successful people working their, you know, their church, their church contacts, network groups. You know, if you're in a network group and it's working for you, that's great. You know, you join a BNI, you join a, you join a chamber of commerce, join the um, leads groups within the chamber. They can be very, very viable. You have to be very strategic in how you work them because you could sit there for a year and not get a lead. But again, paying attention to where you're getting your business from. Lead gen, right? So this is this is all the things that you guys and Alan and Dave in the back and who's training you are going to talk about that I know nothing about. Farming, expired listings, lead purchase, right? 2% on Zillow and Realtor.com if you're purchasing true leads off those, off those internet sites. Um, but I do know a lot, I will tell you this, I do know a lot about niche markets. So here, I'm, I'm going to tell you a story. So I was a non-producing manager for my entire career. Five years ago, I was challenged by my executive management team to go back to my own production. Now, my loan officers, some of them have worked for me for 30 years. They got the realtors covered, if you know what I mean. 
You know, Gerard's showing up with his bagels. You know, I'm, what am I going to do? I'm start calling on people? Of course not. I'm going to not come into the markets. So I was like, well, I have, I have a decision to make. How am I going to get business? And I went after it two ways, two niche markets only. I will let you know, I am currently like ranked 30 out of a thousand loan officers at prime lending. Two niche markets. This is what I did. First, I decided to go after new agents. All you guys. Now, here's the thing. A lot of mortgage lenders don't like calling on new agents because we don't know if you're going to be in the business in two years, right? So how many coffee dates can you really take new agents on? But if I can stand in the front of a room and talk to 20, 30, 40 agents, brand new agents at any given time, if I can work with Dawn and Alan and developing a new agent program, I think you guys are going to give me the benefit of that. You might just think about using me for mortgage money, right? It worked. That was number one. Number two, 2017, 2018. No one was doing renovation loans. This was taking place at a time when HGTV and Chip and Joanna Gaines were ruling the world. The story I tell is my daughter and daughter-in-law both wanted to buy houses that needed no work. They bought houses that needed no work. Then they started watching Chip and Joanna every weekend. And what did I start hearing about? I want to rip out my kitchen. I want to rip out my bathroom. Well, it's really hard to finance these. And most mortgage lenders do not do a great job on renovation loans. So I decided I was going to become a renovation dealer. And I did. Now, here's the thing. You'll get a phone call. Kelly, I want to talk about a renovation loan, blah, blah, blah. Only one out of 10 of those people take renovation loans. But after I razzle-dazzle them with all my expert knowledge, and I have expert knowledge on renovation loans, you think they're going to go anywhere else for their financing? And those two niche markets being very deliberate about how I went after it took me from zero to ranking in the top 20 now at prime lending for production. Those two things. So niche markets can be very powerful, very, very powerful. If you like working with veterans, if you like working with seniors, if you like working renovations, divorce clients, investors, Dave's going to do an entire session for you guys on how to work, how to work with investors. Okay. There are so many places that you could develop a niche market, become an expert in that field, and the next thing, and do a great job branding yourself and marketing yourself. And the next thing you you have a very vibrant, active business. Does that make sense? Okay. Client referrals. This is the one. I'm going to focus on it today because this to me is where so many salespeople drop the ball. Well, we're going to get into client referrals in a little bit right now. Um, let me just show you how this looks. So remember I told you I had a business plan that sat in a draw for 26 years. I don't believe in doing annual business plans. Let's talk about this. If you wrote an annual business plan in January of 2022, do you think that might look a little different than if you were writing that business plan now? Did any of you expect that interest rates were going to triple and that that was going to impact the market? Did any of you expect that this inventory crisis would continue as long as it has? So what we were doing in January as a business plan won't necessarily be working today. Am I correct? So what I believe is that you shouldn't be writing an annual business plan. You need to basically have a quarterly action plan. All right. And what I do, basically, what we do is we basically come up with a one, we call it the one-page business plan. Sometimes we call it an action plan. This is quarterly. We're like, what are the top three things? First of all, like, break out what percentage. We, I did this in 25% increments, but you, you'll know how much you want to get, right? How much business do I really want to get from my personal referrals, from my contacts and my database? I mean, my, it's not your database, your contacts. How much do I want to get? You're going to set your goal, what that number looks like, and then you're going to develop, you're going to come up with three strategies for the quarter on what you need to be doing to develop that amount of business from those sources. Business to business, same thing. Lead gen, same thing. And then you get to, you know, client, uh, client referrals, client referrals and repeat business. So really, really important that you understand what you, where your sources are. How much business? So if you decide you're only going to get 5% of your business from personal referrals, when you're working on this plan, you know that that's not going to be where you allocate a lot of your time and energy, right? Versus if you decide you want to get 50% of your business from client referrals, you know that you've got to have initiatives and action items in your plan that basically speak to the fact that you're expecting a big number out of that source. Okay, and that this is it. That's your business plan, guys. 
You set your income goal worksheet, you develop your, your quarterly action plan, and then depending on how willing you are to meet your goals, you're reviewing it on a consistent basis, right? We saw what the numbers were like from Georgia Tech. Only 1% review them daily. I don't start my day without pulling this document out each day, okay? Because it's easy to get signed. And when I don't do it, you should see where I wind up in my day. Not pretty, not pretty at all. All right, there's a couple things you want to know. I actually think the most successful salespeople focus in areas that they love. I love training people. I love speaking in front of people, okay? If I was afraid of public speaking, let's say, would it be probably a really successful thing for me to do to try to come up and stand in front of people and train them? No. So, but because I love it and I do it well, it's a really successful business development strategy for me. Pay attention to what you love to do. I call those catching, I'm going to talk to you what I call about catch and create a moment. Catch and create a moment is when you basically said, all right, I'm going to make 10 cold calls a day to people, whatever, whatever. I'm going to do these, this activity, or I'm going to do this activity. And you find every day you're hitting that one activity because you love to do it. Relentless evaluation. I love doing this. What do I love about doing this? What, what is it that's so, why is this so easy to me? And yet picking up the phone and making 10 cold calls feels like misery, misery, okay? We want to encourage you to do the things that you love because if you love doing it, you're going to do more of it. You're going to do it well and your business opportunities will, will, will follow. Unique selling proposition. Why you? You have to be really clear on this. You're going to go to a Christmas party this year and somebody's going to tell you they're going to start thinking about a house, okay? Why you? And what makes you different? If you're not clear and succinct on that, why do you guys want to be doing business with me? Because I care more about your clients than anybody else you'll ever meet. And number two, I'm a better lender than anybody else you'll ever use when it comes to lending knowledge, period. Like I believe it, I own it. And I can articulate it very, very clearly. You've got to be able to do that if you're going to be out there. If you want to be able to sell a cop a car after he pulls you over for a speeding ticket, you, you better have a pretty compelling unique selling proposition. Am I right? Okay. Monthly review of results. And then I want to talk to you about another program that I'm certified in, which is called Strength Finder 2.0. So Strength Finder 2.0 falls into this belief that if you work in some, if you work your business in an area that you happen to possess a strength in, you're going to do better. And I've been working with this and I'm certified. I showed up at, in Washington, D.C. for a, somebody introduced me to Strength Finder. I think it was 1999. Loved it. I showed up in Washington, D.C. They come to like, there's all these people in the, in this, in the um, certification seminar. And they ask me to please see them outside. I'm like, wow, like what, why are they taking me outside? It took me outside because I was the first small business owner. Usually it was Fortune 100 companies. Fortune 100 companies were sending their people to this training. I was the first small business owner that had ever signed up for the certification. And they wanted to know why and figure out how they could market to more small business owners. It was a, in 1999, it was a $15,000 certification. We have been using it ever since. So if you want, here's, here's my open invitation to you guys, because this is something I love to do. If you want to know what, what Strength, Strength Finder 2.0 is Gallup, the Gallup organization. You know, they're famous for their polling. This is their assessment program. You can go online, you can order it. You, you can do either your top five strengths. I think that that's like $19.99 for the assessment. Then you and I did it together, right? Mm -hmm. And I sat down and did the um, coaching call with you. Mm -hmm. Right. And do you find that all the time you see where those strengths are showing up in your work? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So you sign, you take the assessment, and if you want me to come out, you send me your assessment. I will come out, I'll treat you to a cup of coffee. I did it with Linda, and I will go through your assessment for you and help you determine how you can be putting those strengths to work. Because what Strength Finder 2.0 says is if you, we all possess, um, a, and there's 32 different, 34 different strengths, and the combination and concentration of those strengths make up that which is uniquely you, Okay. But if, if we're working within our strengths, my, one of mine is communication. People who are strong in communication, like giving presentations, they like training people. Like, like duh, of course that's me. You know, of course that's me. 
But if you understand that, then we can build your action plan around where your strengths are. So that's just an open invitation. You just Google Gallup Strength Finder 2.0. I think you go to shopping and you find it in a cart. If you have any problems, you can call me about it. But I, rec I highly recommend that as a business strategy. This is an older poll. I don't remember the year, but it's still, it's still worth repeating. According to an NAR, 89% of the buyers, 89% of your buyers say they would use you again to sell their home. And yet, only 12% did. Only 9% of people can remember their agent's name two years after the transaction. I actually thought this was a ridiculous statistic. And I'm going to tell you how I proved it recently. So 2000, pandemic comes, financial markets are falling apart, the Fed steps in, drops interest rates. We got one or two refinance calls in 2020, 2021, right? We were barraged by refinance calls. So we call, I would talk to my clients, what's happening and at the same time? Property values are going up. We base lending on, the, especially with refinances, based on the appraised value. You guys know this now. But before now, if anybody, you wouldn't talk to a realtor who had an appraisal problem to save their life. It just never happened before. Last two years, all the time, right? So I would say to my clients, they'd be like, I don't know what the house, I'd say to them, what do you think the house is worth? Well, Zillow says, and like, well, we don't trust Zillow. Well, who was your agent? Who sold you the house? Nine out of 10 times, right? She was a really nice lady. She had blonde hair. I think she was in the shorelines all the time. Because what I wanted to do was take that client and reconnect them with their realtor. Now, you guys get a chance to do a certified market analysis for them. You're re-engaging with your client. I, I, how, how wonderful is Kelly McGinnis at Prime Lending to get to know you? Because I put the client back. They didn't know. They did not. And this is with social media. Like, I actually thought social media would cure this. But this is the last two years, guys. They did not know who their realtors were. Couldn't come up with their names. They liked you. So focusing now on deepening engagements when you have clients is going to be, it's the thing to me that is like the most important thing that you could be focusing on. So there's this other psychologist. I think he too he came out of Harvard. Don't quote me on that. His name is Jay, James Kane. And he has spent his entire career studying customer loyalty. Fascinating. Really fascinating guy. If you, can, if you look him up and you can see him speak at all, really, really fascinating. Building loyal relationships is a process and it requires you to be strategic, deliberate, intentional, and consistent with your approach. If you don't have a consistent, deliberate approach with how you're going to develop and deepen a relationship with a client, that you're just winging it, right? You're just winging it, okay? Now, how do you start? I always tell people, pay attention to what works. So I'm, I'm in the middle right now of training a, a whole group of younger loan officers and I'm giving them my, okay, guys, here's the thing. When you go to send out a loan application package with a client, here's everything you're gonna say. And they're like, oh, I, 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 I go, there's seven things. There's seven points you wanna cover. And you're like, well, what? what? I said, because... Five of the seven points, if you don't cover it now, you're going to get a phone call from the customer asking about it. So we want to be ahead. We want to educate our customers. We want to make sure our customers know every single time, guys, every time you send a loan application package out and you're calling the customer to tell them the loan application package is out, you must cover these seven items. Are we clear? Now, those seven items were literally developed around one, ooh, my customer really responded to this. My customers really liked having this information. This was meaningful for them. Or two, what kind of phone calls was I getting afterward asking me questions about the loan application? So if I could tidy that all up for them and have a great presentation for them at that time, it deepens the relationship. Would you all agree? But you got to know what they are. You got to be every single time. You got to be doing it. You got to be honing that script. I'm not a big fan of scripting. Like, I don't want Alan to give me a script on what I should be saying. I'm talking to my loan officers about the seven points I want them to cover, but not necessarily telling them to say it the Kelly McGinnis way. You know, I, I have a different personality than my, these, all these young loan officers do, all these newer, I shouldn't say young, these newer loan officers do, right? They have to do it their way, but those seven points better be in every single presentation. 
So have to be consistent. When you do this, these are your most committed clients, okay? For those of us who've been doing this for a while, we all have clients who would, I had a client say to me last night, did a renovation for her where we converted her cape into a colonial. She is a serial renovator. She wanted to do another renovation. So we're talking, it, it didn't financially make sense. We didn't think we were going to get the value. We did a lot of work on it. She said, just promise me you're not retired. Can you promise me that? that that's a loyal customer, right? That's somebody who trusts you. We can't imagine going through this process without you. We want everybody to be like that. They will be loyal. So the, the example that James Kane gives is, let's talk about puppies and kittens, cats, dogs and cats. You come home after a day of work and your dog is there. How many people here have dogs, right? They are so happy to see you, am I right? They're like jumping, they're excited, they're happy. It doesn't matter you left them for eight hours a day. They're just so thrilled you're there. You come home, your cat's there and your cat's like, whatever. You know, <laughs> cats don't really have that same. So the, 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 um, Visual that he always gives is we want puppies. We want we want dog. We want our clients to be happy to see us and happy to deal with us, not not indignant like a cat. Customers break down into four key categories according to James Kane. One, this is my client. I love you. Please promise me you're not retiring. There's virtually nothing you can do to break this relationship. Okay, um, they they've come to learn that it's it's an emotional bond. There, there's an emotional bond that takes place with this, okay? I would go so far as to say, Linda and I have developed that kind of emotional bond around training. Because I, I, I can't remember last time I came to a training class and Linda wasn't sitting here. So you develop an emotional bond with a client and, and they, they will not leave you. What else will they do? What else do those clients do 10 times more than anybody else? Tell everybody out, you have, no, no, no. You have to use Kelly McGinnis. No, your life is in danger. Your life is in danger if you don't use Kelly McGinnis. You you didn't use Kelly McGinnis. You went no. Nope, call her now. And we get these calls all the time. They're what? And how good do you feel when those calls come in? You're like, oh, this is why I do this. This is wonderful. Then you have the predisposed. I like you. You did a good job. But maybe something better will come along. Okay. Or somebody else does a better job deepening the engagement and creating an emotional attachment. The, the people who are predisposed, that's where you lose them. You lose them because somebody else engaged them on an emotional level or hit a need that they have that you didn't do. Because it's all a development, right? A goal, right, is to always take the predisposed person and develop them into a loyal puppy. Three, we see so much of this today, transactional. You did a great job, Kelly. Great job. You got paid for it. I owe you nothing. I owe you nothing. You sold my house, will you? You did a great job. You got me a great price. But you got paid well for it. So, you know, next time I'll find somebody who's going to do a good job too. There's not that. And there, I, I'm seeing more of this, I think, in the business now than ever before. And the goal is being ruthlessly trying to think, like, I'm constantly like, all right, how am I? Every conversation I have with a customer, I'm being so deliberate on how I am developing them, how I'm, I'm determining what their needs are on a level that minimizes the transactional. I had a client, this is a true story. So um, I had a client who I had done a pre-approval for. He got the house because it was my pre-approval work, right? So Linda and Wojcik will tell you, Alan, Dave, if you have a listing and you see it's my pre-approval letter, you guys are like, it's because I know what I'm doing and people trust my pre-approval letters. I, I heard, we hear this all the time. They only got the house because it was your pre-approval letter, Kelly. Okay, great. Their offer wasn't as much. This wasn't the best, this wasn't the highest amount, but it was your pre-approval letter. So that's why they got the house. Okay, that's music to my ears, right? The client, um, I quoted him a rate. Rates were going up very, very fast. I quoted him a rate of 5.99% with one point. He found a cut rate lender who would do it at 5% with one point, a full percentage point lower, internet lender. He said to me, he called me back, he said, I said, I don't believe it. I, I don't believe it. Can you get me proof? He gives me proof and he goes, look, I know I only got this house because of you. He said, if you can get me to five and a half percent, 
with one point, I'm not going anywhere else. Call my price best I got. People, I don't care what we're doing. We're taking this client. To have a client willing to pay a half a percent higher than what he was getting at an internet company, right? Take him out of the transactional and make him loyal. That's enormous. It's enormous. And when those experiences happen to you, it's, it's really going to, one, restore your faith in humanity. Like I would walk on fire for this guy. And two, um, you know, you just, it's just, it's just a, a much more pleasurable way to do business. And then you have your hostile people. I hate you. I just hate you. I wouldn't use you again for all the money in the world. And our goal is to never have those people, but every once in a while we get one, right? You've done everything right, but something is not right somewhere. Sometimes that they're crazy. Let's be honest. <laughs> we are. Sometimes they're crazy. Has anybody ever had a crazy client? Okay. Sometimes they're crazy. Sometimes you just it just didn't work between the two. It ha it does happen. It does happen. Did a renovation loan for a guy. I rocked it. I called my my daughter in law was in labor. The baby was just born. I didn't even get to see the baby. I stepped out to help this guy. I hit I hit this guy. And all summers, this guy says to me, started off by saying, I hate everyone. I want you, I want you, I want to set the table. I hate everyone. I'm like, okay. So I was my goal to like make him love me, right? I just was always, always, and I hit him on. Oh, I did it. I did it. Closed the loan. We have a policy. It's an it's an added value service that when a customer closes a loan, they get a notice in their loan application in their closing documents on how they make their first payment. What do I pay attention to? Most people can't find that. So usually about two weeks into the, after the closing, I get a call from a client that says, uh, how am I going to make my first payment? It happened all the time. So what do we do? I pay attention. I got ahead of it. So loan closes now. Every two weeks, we send out a letter. Hey, just want to make sure you had this. Every client can't find this. This is a courtesy. Hope everything's great in the house. Left. All my clients love it, except this guy, Kyle, called me up, f bombed me. <laughs> How dare you try to collect my payment two weeks earlier than when it's due? Wrote a scathing review on me because of, and I, yeah, he hates people. So, you know, there's crazy people out there. We just have to try to screen that sooner rather. I should have let him go. And experienced salespeople like we, we know, right? Like when he told me he hated everybody is what I should have said to him was, I wish you all the luck getting alone. Have a nice day. Mm -hmm. But it was it was Reno, and I, you know that's my thing. So I was like, no, I can, I got this. So now, is there anybody here who doesn't know who Gary V is? I, I think Alan is like the child Gary V had. Alan has a very <laughs> Gary V vibe to him these days. His your social media stuff looks a lot like him. It's fantastic, you know. So I love Gary V. You have to take. Is there anybody here who doesn't know who he is? Okay, so Gary V is a guy whose family owned um, a liquor store. And he took the liquor store and turned it into an internet company, became like a gazillionaire. And now he's like a, a social media marketing guru. He's kind of a wild guy. Alan doesn't do this, swears insanely. So if you're gonna watch Gary V, you gotta be comfortable with the F word, okay? But a lot of what he says is pretty compelling. So he wrote a book called The Thank You Economy. And it's such a fascinating book. If you want to read a book about deepening a customer, this is a phenomenal book. So he talks about social media and how to use social media to deepen relationships. You know, and, and these are his, these are the highlights. Business is only as strong as your closest customer relationships. Developing those relationships. So same thing that John Kane is saying, we're seeing this out of Gary V. Okay. It's, and what he always says, it's not the number of friends, followers, and contacts. It's the strength of the bond you create with them. So where you have a lot of social media people, and, and I, I'm not one of these people, but a lot of social media people will talk about just it's the amount of contact, right? You're just, you're just hitting with a lot of contact. Gary Vee goes one step further and says it's also the quality of your content, you know, making sure you're, you're using social media to deepen that relationship. Because it makes sense, right? So here's a story that I read in the Thank You Economy, which blew my mind, but it's so great. So in the book, The Thank You Economy, Gary Vee tells a story about John Pepper, who owns the Loco, which is um, uh, 
burrito Mexican food chain. I don't know how many stores he has. One of them is at Daniel Hall in Boston. I don't know if anybody's ever been there or seen it, right? So uh, the John Pepper, the owner, is obsessed with Twitter and filing his company on Twitter. Not because, because he wants to try to find opportunities to make an impact. So he's on Twitter and he sees a, a tweet from a woman who basically says, I'm sitting outside of Daniel Hall. Food's good, but oh my God, the music's so loud, I can barely hear myself think. He sees it. He calls the manager of that store and says, you've got somebody sitting outside. The music's too loud. Please turn your music down and go out and apologize to her. And they do. Well, little did we, they know that Rachel Levy is a blogger. And so she wrote this whole blog that blew up about the fact of how John Pepper and Boloco, Boloco, I don't know how to say it, responded to her need, okay? And the amount of attention that that single attention to customer detail, customer service meant, made them famous, made them absolutely famous, okay? Social media is powerful if it's genuine, authentic, it demonstrates care, it, this is according to Gary V, it, um, so that people feel compelled to act. So, I want to talk to you about two things that are, that as a sales manager and as a sales coach, I'm always hyper-focused on for my own business and with my people. And that is deepening engagement for genuine relationships. And there's two processes that require your attention if you're really going to develop a thriving database of customer referrals and repeat customers, okay? One is what I call when they're captive. So how long does it take you to work with a client to find a house today? We know your listings are only on the market for a day. So those are shorter relationships. But if you're working with buyers right now, you could be with them for months right now. Am I right? Months. They're captive. You have them captive. It's always so heartbreaking to me when a realtor refers a deal to us and they've been working with a realtor for two or three months and all of a sudden we get a call, they've switched realtors. And I know that that original realtor is a really good agent. And typically it's because there's been a, a break in trust or communication or something. And it's always heartbreaking to me because it's when we have them captive, we have our most of our opportunity, right? So while you're working with them, we call those captive processes. And then the second is post close. So I'll go through this a little bit more. Okay. So first and foremost, you have to de determine what your service mindset is. What, what do you want to be known for um, when you're providing service? Maybe you are absolutely fantastic at determining um, property values and what somebody should list their house for. Maybe that, maybe like your, your analysis of the of the of real estate and your expertise in the analysis of real estate is so that that's, that's a service you want to provide your customers. You've got to decide what it is that you is your, mine is, I care more than anybody else. I don't care, put a million lenders in here right now. I'll kick all their asses. I care about these clients more than anybody else. I care about them like they're my family and I'm not exaggerating, okay? That's how deeply vested I am in having them have a successful transaction and feel like they were educated throughout and cared for through the process, okay? So do you have a servant mindset? Are you willing to go the extra mile? Are you willing to do whatever it takes? And if the answers to those, it doesn't always have to be yes, but you've got to be clear about what it is so that you can, you can develop your, your service approach. If you've got a sales approach, you need a service approach. What's your, what's your service delivery approach going to be and how do you articulate that to a client? It needs to be individual. When it, so you need a process. Anytime that we can make something a system, it's going to always work better. But but don't be such a slave to the system that you miss the opportunity to do something individualized for a client. So I'll give you an example. I had a client she's coming to Yale. Um, she's coming in, started Yale. We developed a great relationship. You know, but I knew she was talking to a couple other lenders. So I said to her, "You have." Have you had New Haven pizza yet? She's like, what? I go, have you had a New Haven pizza yet? She goes, no. I go, well, when are you coming back into town to look at houses? Boom. I said, oh, 
You have to have pizza. You, you will not believe what our pizza is like in New Haven. I've talked to her about pizza. Do you like pizza? I like pizza. I go, oh, no, no, no. When you're done in New Haven, you're going to love pizza. I have this whole pizza thing going. So I got done. I sent her a $25 gift card to mom and pizza, right? I don't send gift cards like that to all my clients, but we'd have this whole, you know, of course she wasn't going to She wasn't going to it. And it's not because of the $25. It's just that I engaged, it was an engagement, an opportunity to engage, right? Um, you want to get to know them, right? Pro, pro, pro. People, people all the time like, oh, I want to buy a new house because of this. So well, why, why, why? Like those same, you can't ask too many questions. You have to be good at it. You have to do it in a way where they don't feel like they're being interviewed by Barbara Walters. <laughs> um, but, you know, to the extent that you can practice and develop great questioning strategy, great questions and questioning technique, you'll do so well, okay? So now you guys, a lot of you are younger. So you millennials are just gonna have to trust me on this story. So years ago, there was a there was a commercial that used to be on TV for Gims and Knives. Does anybody here remember those Gims and Knife commercials? Like they diced, they 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 talked about all the billions and trillions of things that these Gims and Knives did, and they were selling features, feature, feature, feature. Does this, does that, does this, does that, and they, and they loaded you up to the point that you're like, how much is this knife going to cost me? And then they would tell you, it's nine dollars and ninety nine cents. And you were shocked and awed because you could get all this, all these features. Selling features provokes price concerns. So guys, I'm gonna tell you right now, I could do a whole nother, another workshop on selling features versus selling benefits. If you walk into a house and you say to the customer, it's got these are the three bedrooms. Here's the living room, here's the dining room. Oh, look, here's the Viking stove. Oh, look, here. and that's the way you're showing a house you're the Ginzu Knight guy. Because what are they gonna, how much is this all gonna cost me? And people get especially that way, the larger the ticket item is. Selling benefits has, you have to make sure that you, that you probe them to understand what their needs are enough so that when you're showing that house, you're correlating what's in that house and how it meets their needs. Because if you're gonna go through a showing doing what I just said, all you're gonna get is price concerns. And in today's market with where buyers are currently sitting, on, on everything, interest rates, home prices, multiple offers, going over asking price, they're already predisposed to price concerns. So you've got to get really, really good at understanding what their needs are and making sure when you're showing them a house that you're tying that together, okay? There's only two things that will convince a customer to pay more. Science shows it, convenience and outstanding service, outstanding. Not good, outstanding, standing apart. Now, here's the thing. I've been teaching this for uh, many, 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 many years. And here's what I can tell you. It's never been so easy to stand out with your service because there's terrible service all around us. Horrible service all around us. Horrible. We actually expect crappy service now in America, I think. Mm -hmm. So when you take extra time, we train, I trained all my processors and and um, closers and everybody else is having customers, like a simple thing, right? How many times are you on the phone with somebody, you know, most of the time they're just rushing to get off the phone with you. So we trained our entire internal staff on this need. He's basically said, you pause after you've helped them, you pause every time you talk to them, you pause and you say, is there anything else that I can help you with today? It's a simple question. But all of a sudden it creates this, this understanding that you're not too busy for them, okay? And people are braced for that today. They're expecting you to be too busy for them. So what kinds of things can you do to be providing outstanding service? So first thing I would say is, okay, you, while, they're, while they're captive, while you have them in process, you want to bury them with contact. You don't want to, you don't want to put somebody on an auto search. That's one way, right? When you put them on an auto search, and expect that auto search to be the thing that develops the relationship. It helps because they're getting contact. Okay, we have a we have a, a practice in our group where we basically say our goal while they're in process is to get one referral from every customer. I want you to think about the power of that simple goal. My goal is to double my business. My goal is to get one referral from every customer while. They're in process. 
You think we have to be a bit intentional to achieve that goal? No, we haven't hit it. It's, it's a, that is a monstrous goal, but we're constantly perfecting what we do. We, we, so we don't say, well, this didn't work. I've had this goal for about five years. I've never said this doesn't work. We're not doing this. This doesn't, no, I'm not doing it quite, quite right yet. You know, we're getting about 50%. We're, we've hit about 50%, but I, I'm not going to rest till I know it's one from every person. And it's really wonderful when you get a referral from them and then I can give it back to the realtor who referred the business to us, right? These are, these are the intent, the um, activities we set, okay? So there's a part of your brain. Has anybody ever heard, I know those people have, of the reticular activating system? Same, are there people who don't know what that is? Okay, so I, I wanna break down a myth for you in real estate, okay? So the reticular activating system is a part of your brain that identifies situations or people who are in a similar situation to you. The couple of examples that I always give is you go into a car dealership, you find, you find a car, you've never seen it, it's your car, you love the car, you're getting ready to pull out. No one's ever had this color car. It's just so hot and five of them drive by, right? All of a sudden you see that car. Every time I was pregnant with one of my kids, I was convinced there was a baby being born because all I saw were pregnant women, okay? So here's the reason I'm telling you this story when it comes to your people in process. It's so common when I'm coaching salespeople that I say, when are you asking for referrals? Oh, Guys, call reluctance. Here's, here's how call real. Oh, I, I can't ask for a referral until the loan closes and they're happy with me through the whole process. No, no, because guess what? If you're waiting till after they close to ask their particular activating system and who else might be wanting a house is shut down. You know what they're thinking at that point? What, am I, what color am I going to paint my bedroom? They're not there. Their whole system, it's like trying to teach kids how to, you know, talk um, languages after those synapses, of, you know, adults, it's harder because our synapses have closed down in our brain. You want to hit that reticular. They know most. You need to be asking for referrals or setting the expectation from referrals very early on. If you wait to the end, you're missing a phenomenal opportunity. That was the first and most important thing we learned when we started doing this. Now you have to have a great script and how you can do it comfortably, especially if, you know, you experience a little call reluctance or you feel the way nine out of 10 people say that to me. I can't ask. I need to prove myself. I can't ask. Yes, you can. And people who are good at this are going to take your clients if you don't get good at it. So yes, you need to do this. You need to come up with a way that you're framing it. And how many times during the process are you going to ask? Okay. What's going to make them say, wow, you want to scour social media looking for ways to help remember the burrito? You want to set up their expectation that you're their house expert for life. You need a plumber, you call me. You need somebody to work on your house, you call me. You guys all have these contacts. Why would you want them going to Angie's list or somebody else? I'm going to tell you a really honest story um, about my life in 2020 and 2021. So I, literally for 19 months, I worked 16 hour days, seven days a week without a break. 19 months. The, the, it was relentless. The amount of business was relentless, okay? And I had gotten to the point, and, and at the end of those 16 or 17 hours, I still had a mountain of work to do. It got to the point where if a customer called me, I was like, what do they want? Like, uh, like, I was feeling that way a lot. And all of a sudden, relentless evaluation of yourself, I thought, what am I doing? How... I mean, it's, it was so understandable why I felt this way, but oh my gosh, how am I, I can't keep doing this. So I changed every communication for myself. So I'm going to tell you what I did to get myself in check. Every email, every text, I would say, please let me know if you have any more questions. I'm here to help. And I would not put that in a template. I forced myself to type that line every single time, because I needed a major anchor for myself on remembering that I wanted to welcome customer phone calls. You don't want to get customer calls saying, you want to engage people in a way where you're getting customer calls that, that aren't because you didn't do your 
job well, right? Like my customers need to know that, okay, you're going to sign your application package. Then you're going to get in a link that's going to have you pay for the appraisal. Like that's educating them on the process, right? I don't want to get that phone call because I could have done a better job helping them up front and not created uncertainty or anxiety. But other phone calls, yes, yes. This client of mine who I've been working on this renovation deal, I just told you she asked me going to retire. I knew from the beginning this wasn't going to work. I fielded probably 17 different phone calls from her. I knew her deal was not going to work, but she really wanted it. I wasn't ready to tell her no yet because we had to get a little more diligence to see what the bid was going to come in. I knew it wasn't going to work. But every time she called, I made sure I answered that phone call. And then I put her in the hands of another lender who could do a home equity line for and that's what she said. I don't even want to do that. Just tell me you're not retiring. And we'll look at this again next year when, when rates come down. Right. Um, keep meticulous notes about their interests and preferences. We always want puppies, right? And always, 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 again, you're going to read the happiness advantage. That was the first thing I told you how to do. This is the second thing. You need to check in with them one week after they close, and you need to check in with them one month after they close. Okay? Because the amount of questions they typically have during that time frame are astronomical, and you can be a resource to them. So if you're not if you're not making that phone call, okay. Now, in my business, one of the things that stresses customers out to no end is when the servicing of their loan gets sold. Yeah. Now, who do I make my payment to? I why did my loan get sold? They hate this. Okay, they don't hate it. It stresses them out. And we let them know that there's a very good chance their loan servicing is going to get sold, but it stresses matter. Every month, on the first of the month, I get a list of loan services that are going to be sold. Loans that are going to be sold. Now, we've already sent them, we've sent them an email, we've sent a, um, um, a letter. But you know what we do? My team makes a phone call to them or sends a text and says, could you please call me about your mortgage payment? Right? That's, that's provocative. Like, I must be late on my mortgage payment because we want to talk to them. It specifically says that because I want them to be provoked to call us. And then we deliver this unbelievably wonderful, um, we have this great conversation with them about, hey, listen, did you get the notice that says your loan servicing is going to be sold? And we go through a whole script on different points that have to be covered to make sure they're comfortable, they understand what it means means, they know where to make their payments. If for some reason they didn't get the letter, we make sure we give them the letter. Like, it's just a place. So you want to be checking in with people when there's an opportunity for you to be a resource during those pivotal times, one week, one, one month after closing. Does that, does, does that, does that resonate with you? Like for those of you that own a house, like again, I remember when I bought one of my houses the first week, we had three leaks. I was like, oh my God, I bought a lemon. How could this happen to me, right? The realtor did a really good job checking in with me and she made sure she sent a plumber over who took care of everything. Now, she was a, this happens to be the same realtor who sold the cop the house. Uh, yeah, I just realized it happens to be the same person. Like, it wasn't a major plumbing bill. She took care of it. I'm not suggesting you take care of it financially. But if you have the opportunity to help, like think about the engagement that, that creates, right? Mm -hmm. I also really strongly recommend it for those of you who are new to the business, if you can get into this habit now before you get really busy and successful and it feels like a pinch to you, I am a big proponent that you set a budget of how much money you're going to take out of each of your closings and put it aside in a reserve fund, okay? I take $250 from every single one of my closings and it goes into a reserve fund that I use for a variety of things. Here are some examples, okay? Um, handwritten thank you note at the time that I get a lead with a giveaway. So this reserve fund helps me pay for the giveaways. We send out jar openers, these flimsy little jar openers that people seem to love, but okay. Starbucks gift card at the time of the broker, fire broker, or listing. We make status calls to our clients twice a week and to our realtors who are referring them. Moving kits, you know, again, today. So Present millennials exclude. I cannot get over the stuff that my kids don't know how to do. Like they'll call me, my daughter will call me so, the daughter who went to Yale, by the way, who is not one of those like super so bright, she doesn't have common sense, she'd be like, um, I just got a notice about my escrows. 
on my mortgage. And she's, she's stressed. You tell her this is normal, normal, like calm down. It's crazy when she, when she moved. How am I supposed to make sure that my mail follows me, Mom? Like crazy. And I'm like, oh my God, you don't even post on it. <laughs> so there's, there's opportunities for you to solve problems in really easy ways. You know, set up a moving kit. Give it to them a week before they close. For years, we gave out the change of address stamps. You know, people don't use those anymore. I was spending, I don't know, $25 of closing on these. And I was like, nobody uses these anymore. But, you know, there's all sorts of things you can do. Um, exciting texts to show them who you really are. Here's another thing that works for me, okay? When I get the clear to close on a loan, I send the client a text and I go, are you sitting? Oh, I was like, oh no, are you sitting down? Freaks them out. They go, yes. I go, you're clear to close, capital letters, you know, emojis, emojis. They're like, oh my God. Ah, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Does anybody know about the law of reciprocity? So there's a law that basically says, if I do something for you, there's this inherent psychological need to repay the favor. Okay, it's called the law of reciprocity. So I always say, when you have a client say thank you to you, it's a great time to put the law of reciprocity to work. So my customers go, thank you, thank you. We couldn't have done this without you. Here's my response every time. I'm so happy for you. Now can I ask you a favor? And I just, and I don't tell them what the favor is. Yes, of course, anything. Would you be willing to give me a five-star review? I'll send you the link. It's just so important for other customers to know that we're trustworthy and we'll take great care of them. My reviews went up exponentially when I started using that process. Okay, so have fun, be yourself, engage the customer in a way that's going to be meaningful. Do you give them a closing gift? Do you give them a holiday gift? Is anybody here familiar with Brian Buffini and his Popeye strategies? He's, he's the master, man. I'm telling you. And I had to really get over myself. I, I did Brian Buffini coaching for a couple of years. I had to really get over myself because a lot of, so let me tell you what he is. He's a real estate coach and a mortgage coach. And he is a big believer in buy referral only. You do your business buy referral only. And one of the strategies are Popeyes. And this is a, this is a time for you to pop by your client's house with a little gift. And I had my nose in the air about the kind of gifts. I mean, like we're talking little chachi gifts. And I was just like, oh no, I am too good for this. I would never, I would never deliver anti-freeze to all my customers. That's so chachi. I'm just telling you, I would, I'm being honest with you guys about how I had to be honest with myself. But then I saw people doing it and getting a really good, really good feedback. If any of you at Thanksgiving see that a mortgage lender or a realtor is giving away Thanksgiving pies, that's a Brian Buffini strategy. We do it every year, okay? So one year I'm like, oh, let me go deliver antifreeze to my customers. They loved it. They loved it. They couldn't believe I was thinking of it. So I was like, all right, Kelly, you just gotta get over yourself. And so they call it Popeye gifts, right? And, and if you Google Popeye gifts, you'll get more pumpkins, moms, um, ketchup and mustard packets, from Costco um, when, when you have your first, um, for their first, um, on, I'm skipping ahead, but like for your first picnic in your new home, tulip bulbs in the fall. I mean, you set up a Popeye campaign where you're like hitting them twice a year. I think Buffini's plan is four. Is anybody here in Buffini? I think his is four times a year or maybe once a month. I don't remember, but anyway, we also do, we all, I also set aside what I call emergency funds, okay? I, I told you, I really care about my clients. So I, um, I've been known to send a housekeeper to, um, I, had a, I had a couple who gave birth to a child who had a lot of health issues. I sent a housekeeper to them for three weeks so that they didn't have to think about, you know, they didn't have to think about it. And I, again, it's a way to engage and stuff, but it was more because I just felt, I just wanted to do something to help. And it was the way I could, I could step in and help them. So there's all sorts of things that you can, you can pick up um, there. Um, according to Ninja Selling, which is, the, which is the course that I was introduced to with Wojcik and Linda, um, you, you need multiple, oh, this is, this, is, um, this is in the way. You need to be in touch with people 30, 36 times a year. 
36 touches a year with your dad. 36 touches, three times a month. Now, if you haven't read the book, Ninja Selling, I would highly recommend it. It's all about how to become a, a, a rock star real estate agent. That's all about, it's all about real estate agent, okay? And, and the guy who owns the company, Larry, um, whatever, okay, I can't remember his name, but he, um, I keep thinking Larry David, but it's not, it's not Larry David. He, um, for many, many years, he employed this Ninja Selling system with his agents. He had the number one office in America of top producing agents, meaning he took all of his agents for high producers. It wasn't like he had one or two and then low performers. They were all top producers. So it's a real, if you like doing business with people belly to belly and by, by referral only, it's a great book to read, okay? Kendall. Kendall, Larry Kendall, thank you. So multiple, multiple methods, right? You're gonna do, a, maybe you're doing a pop by, maybe you're sending a newsletter. Um, maybe you are, contacting them on social media. You're engaging them, you know, on social media. So um, does anybody, here, besides these guys, does anybody here know my brother-in-law, Gerard McGinnis? He's kind of, you do, he's famous for dropping off bagels to all the offices, you know, where he does, where he, he does business. It's what, it's his thing. And he's famous for it and that's great. Gerard became, so Gerard, and if you know Gerard, he's, he's you know, we're not, we're not talking about anybody who's tech side. I, I don't want to tell you he can't turn on his computer, but guys, <laughs> okay. But here's what he's really good. You know what he loves doing? He loves wishing people a happy birthday. He became legitimately a Facebook influencer. He reached that designation on Facebook by simply saying happy birthday every single day to anybody who's having a birthday in his. And I'm like, Gerard, these are my clients. Bye, honey. But these are my clients. Stop. No, I just, I just look down and happy birthday. It makes me happy. And it does. So the first thing he does every morning, he has his coffee. And, you, and you'll see it. He's even lazy about it, I have to say. It's HBD. HBD. I, I know you two, but I've got him, right? So, but I was like, oh my God, the power of social media. That, but he did it consistently. And he probably did it for a year before he reached that status in Facebook. Crazy, right? Just that simple thing. Um, so again, you want to be uber considerate. You want to develop your three times per month system. Look for opportunities to personalize. Here's a whole bunch of help them help them get rid of their moving boxes. I, I know realtors who've done really, really well because they provide moving boxes to their clients. And then they and then do you know how stressed out people are about what they're going to do with all these boxes afterward? But people get stressed about I was so stressed about it when I moved. And then you know, come take them away and give them to the next person. You just take something off their to-do list. People are thrilled. Pizza on moving day. Activities. This is that first campaign we talked about. The first year, you're going to send something. You know, you're going to send them tulips in the fall for their first fall in the house. You're going to send them, you know, something at Christmas time. So I actually don't send Christmas gifts, and I don't send Christmas cards because how many of us open those cards like, oh, that's nice. Here's my insurance agent. Here's my realtor. Here's my mortgage person. Because you're getting them. I we send them out of the state. Right, because you're just there's not as many of them that are going out, or we send them out in New Year's. We've done both. Okay, just set yourself apart so you get a little more, a little more attention. Um, the Buffini pop by campaign, and then there's also a really there, there's platforms now that are coming out to do this for you or instead of you. I don't like the instead of you. Is anybody, is anybody familiar with Homebot? So, what Homebot is, Homebot's purpose is to combat Zillow. And what Homebot is, where, where most people want to know what their house is and they go on Zillow to find out, Homebot, you can purchase Homebot for your database, sends them a monthly report on their property. I, I should actually add this to this presentation. The engagement percentage of people on Homebot is insane when you look at other platforms that you could be using for outbound reaching to your customers. I want to say something like 65% of people engage in it. Something like 80% open it. I mean, when you look at these types of platforms, nobody, nobody has an 80% open rate and a 75% engagement rate. Okay. But it's because people want to know what their houses are worth. So if you, if you know, if you want to use Homebot and they get that monthly report and the opportunity to create dialogue and you can put a video on it, that's one way. Or you just basically let people know, guess what? Once a year, we're going to, we're going to call you. We're going to talk about the real estate market. 
people always want to know what their house is worth. Any opportunity, especially now with what's been going on, any opportunity you have that you can um, get them there will help. Guys, I can't even read what my number is here. Set a goal of number of database. Because my little, because the screen is here. How do we, let's see if I can move it. I don't know. Well, I'm going to tell you what that number is because I don't know it off the top of my head when I close the presentation. Make sure you're make sure you're doing that, okay? So <clears throat> really important. I'm going to start wrapping this up and then open it up to questions. And we've got lunch waiting for you. I always tell people really important that you put your phone down before you go out to meet a new buyer. And stuff. Put your phone down center yourself and do some pre-call planning. You go in, you meet the client, you have a presentation, then you come back to your car, you don't open your phone and you set and determine how that call went, what worked, what didn't work. 10 minutes before your call, 10 minutes after your call can make all the difference in the world on how you're setting up your business for success. Okay, pre-call and post-call planning. Scripting, I've talked to you about scripting. I don't believe in using somebody else's script, but I do believe you need to have those aha moments. If you have somebody who said, here's what I hear all the time. When we do a pre-approval, I call the customer and I have a financial consultation call. Now it's not, not uncommon that somebody else has been pre-approved by another lender when I get them. Maybe it was a year ago, maybe it was a month ago. I finished my whole consultation call with them. And this is what I hear every time, every time they've been pre-approved by another lender. I hear this every time. I can't thank you enough. Our other lender didn't go through any of this with us. None of this. I had no idea. Okay. So scripting, I have a very intentional script that pays attention to what's working. I would never shortcut that script ever because I know it works. And how do I know? Because I pay, I pay attention. Time blocking and then mindset management. So I'm going to talk to you. I, I promised you I'd give you this. Oh, let me just say this about time blocking. We, I recommend you time block in writing in your calendar. So in my calendar, my business development activities are, are in green. And so here's an example. Here's two strategies that I think are really important to use. One is called the buy new effect. It helps combat call reluctance. If you, if you don't love some of the sales activities you have to do, the recommendation is do them by noon time. Get them out of the way, get them off the, you know, I think we call it swallowing the frog hole too, right? Like you want to get this done earlier in your day when you're fresher and when your opportunity to come up with excuses about why you're not going to do it, increase. So buy noon effect, blackout. My team knows, like, it's not so common now because we don't work in the office as much anymore. But when I was in the office, I actually had a sign that said power off. And my whole staff knew like you couldn't interrupt me because that was my uninterrupted time to be making my sales calls. Okay, so those are two strategies. And then I like setting up in my calendar. This is this is what my calendar looks similar to. On Monday mornings, I'm calling business to business you know, looking to set up appointments, coffee dates, whatever, to meet new real estate agents, accountants, financial planners, you know, people who can, contractors who can send me renovation loans. On Tuesday, we make a status update call to every client and every realtor. And we let people know this. I'm, you're gonna hear, you might hear from me more than that, but on every Tuesday, you'll get an update from us. So it's not uncommon that we have somebody clear to close weeks before they're closing. We'll call them Tuesday. Guess what? It's Tuesday. There's been no change. Your loan is still perfect. You're still perfect. But we're just calling to say hi. Here's your status quo. Okay. Wednesday, that's when we're making personal contacts and past clients by ranking. So if I have somebody who's actively referring me, if I've got a client who has sent me five deals this year, there I'm hitting them more often, right? I'm ranking my database. There's somebody who's vibrantly referring me. I'm going to call them more often and, and set up my calling schedule around those, those types of clients. Thursdays, we follow up with leads. Are you still out there looking? What's going on? How'd it go? 
And on Fridays, it's called personal contact, again, personal contacts and past clients by database. This is also when I personally do recruiting calls in my industry. So set up a routine where you're making those calls, you know exactly what you're gonna be doing every day. I recommend that it's never less than two hours. If you're spending less than two hours a day on that stuff, and if you're a new agent, and you don't have a big pipeline, it should be more than that. Like you just gotta be going for it, okay? All right, um, managing your mindset. You wanna protect this fiercely at all costs. To Alan's point, the days when he noticed he was smiling and waving to the cars, he had a better mindset through the day than when he didn't. You have to fiercely protect your mindset, especially today, especially today. Like pick up the news on social media, pick up, there's so much coming at us that is not good. And it can drain you if you're not fiercely protecting your mindset. Your focus, you know, the law of attraction, there's a law of attraction, which again, is it airy fairy, is it the secret? But, but here's what we know. Oprah said it best, that which you focus on expands. And I learned this by practicing the happiness advantage a hundredfold. Okay, and I'm gonna show you what those practices are. Definitely put your focus in places where you're focused on success and you will have more success. If you focus on everything that's wrong or everything that's a problem, you're gonna have more problems. That's your reticular activating system giving you more of what you're focusing on, okay? These are some proven strategies on how to do it, um, but I wanna get to this part for you. So this is, this is my boyfriend, Sean Aker. So when I first discovered him, I, anybody who knew me knew that I was in love with Sean Aker. Everybody who knew me knew I was in love with Sean Aker. That which you focus on expands. So every year my company has this massive sales rally in Dallas. And this one year I couldn't go. I had a conflict. It's so rare for me to not go. And a woman who works in Dallas called me. She said, of all the years, this is the year you're not coming. And I'm like, what? what? She goes, do you know who our keynote speaker is? I go, no. She goes, Sean Aker. I'm like, what? She's like, Kelly, Sean Aker is our. I would, you would have thought Mick Jagger was coming to Prime Lending. I was like, oh, I don't remember what the conflict was. I got out of it. I booked my ticket. Now, fast forward another couple of days, the president of our bank calls me, the president of the company calls me, he says, I hear you're a big fan of this guy, Sean Aker. I'm like, I am. I said, if I get to meet him, do you think I could actually meet him? He goes, well, Kelly, you can't be a groupie, like calm down. But yes, we're going to have you meet him. You're going to have breakfast with him. And then you're going to introduce him to the entire company of like 3,000 people. I was like, oh my God. That which you focus on expands. Okay. So this is a picture of me introducing him. And my legs were shaking and I never get nervous speaking, but I was so excited about him. This is a picture of me and Sean on the bottom. I, I was a little bit of a group. I go, Sean, oh my gosh. I I've been fine. I know everything about you. I listen to you every single day. And in his presentation, he kept making some jokes about like, look, when you publish a psych paper, you know, you're lucky if your mother reads it. Because in my case, my mother and Kelly McGinnis. But, you know, I was just like, ah. Anyway, here are his seven proven strategies about it. So here's the thing about the happiness advantage. In America, we're programmed to believe that once we have success, we will be happy. When in fact, neuroscience proves it's the exact opposite. Alan's having a more successful day when he's waving at cars with his beautiful son every day than when he doesn't do it. I promise you, if you do this, if you do these strategies for 30 days, you will call me, you better call me and tell me it made a difference in your life because I promise you will. So here's, here's what they are. Daily gratitude. Now, when the gratitude wave took place in America, journaling for gratitude, I thought this was impossible to do. Because I would get up every morning, I'm like, I'm grateful for my husband, most days, I'd say that. <laughs> I'm grateful for my family, I'm grateful for my health, and I'm grateful for my job. I just thought it was so difficult to do and so uninspiring. But what the happiness advantage says, what our brain needs is three new things to be grateful about every day. That's the kicker. Three things that day new. So all of a sudden you can't put like my, you know, the way I was doing it. And it's hard, guys. It's hard. But here's what happens. That whole part of your brain 
And they've proven this in um, FR, FRMI machines. They've proven that the centers of your brain light up differently when you're practicing this. Your brain will start searching it out. Now, how different is your day going to be if your brain is helping you search out reasons to be grateful? You think that's going to be a different type of day than if you weren't looking for that? And what they find in the FRMI machines is the more you do this, the more your brain lights up. It's, it is a physiological, biological change in your brain. Two, you want to journal a positive experience because your brain doesn't know that. So if you, so I'm going to go home, guys, guess what I'm going to journal about today? Like I had a great day. The audience was really engaged. I cracked a couple of funny jokes. People laughed at my jokes. It was so good to see some friends of mine here. Like you're going to, and the more that you can journal about, you can do this on a paper napkin. It amplifies it because your brain doesn't know the difference between your memory, your memory of it and you doing it. So it's like you did it twice. And again, in 21 days, your brain's going to start looking for the positive in everything. Three, exercise. We, I don't have to preach about that. There are, there are, volumes of books and studies done about the fact that my daughter's a psychiatric nurse practitioner. Do you know how many studies there are that prove if people exercise, there's a very good chance they can come off their, um, their depression medication? That's powerful, right? Or meditation. Now, this doesn't have to be like, you don't have to go learn how to do, um, I can't remember what that meditation is called. Anyway, this can be a simple 10 minutes refocusing yourself but practicing it every day, just practicing clearing your mind and setting your intentions, okay? You don't have to go out and learn them. Um, oh, what is that called? Thank you, TM, thank you. This is, this, is, this is the most powerful one, okay? Random acts of kindness. You need to either send one positive email to somebody or the thing that I love to do is pay for somebody's coffee in line behind me at Dunkin' Donuts. One random act of kindness a day, every single day. Like, don't you feel good when you do something good? Right? You get a dopamine there. There's a physiological reason for it. You get a dopamine there. So to the fact that you're practicing that every single day, these five habits, I guarantee you, you're going to experience more success because you're going to be feeling great. You're going to be feeling powerful. You're going to be feeling positive and everything is just going to flow from the, from that mindset. Yeah, that's it. Does anybody have any questions on it? Um, can you start kind of like the overall question? You talked about database management and uh, I used to basically use it myself, but I kind of keep track of things, but what are some other people doing? Yeah, that's a great question for you. What are you using for CRO? I've gone through a lot of them. Honestly, in my opinion, it doesn't matter what CRO you use, as long as you have the best CRO collection. Right. And you really don't need a lot of fancy features. All you really need is a picture of a note. You want to be able to collect your name, phone number, email, and address, set task reminders, right. and set dates, uh, like a date reminder. I usually make the anniversary date. Save the cell phone. I save the birthday numbers uh, in my calendar. I don't know what I mean. What was the CRM? Uh, that was KB4. I mean, there's a lot of them. There's so many of them. And I think, I think the interface, like if you can have something that interfaces with whatever calendar you like, we use Outlook yeah. and we use Salesforce and they interface, right? So Salesforce picks up the birthday, drops it in Outlook. Salesforce picks up the anniversary. You can, we can program it. So, you know, it's just a matter of whatever that interface is. Mm -hmm. I think Excel works really well with everything. Mm -hmm. um, it's just learning how to use Excel in a way that's really effective. I went from not knowing anything, just messing around with it and going online looking at stuff. And the amount of stuff that you can do with Excel is unbelievable. Yeah, and calendars now merged. Yeah, yeah. A lot of different yeah. It works for every yeah. calendar program. So. So for us, what we do is we want as many data fields, important data fields come in from the mortgage application. There's not a more comprehensive document about the customers. You know, we, they have their birthdays, their anniversary of closing, their, you know, their fall, everything's in that mortgage application document. So in my world, it's all about 
can it, you know, are we working with a system that takes all the information we want off the mortgage app into the CRM into our so and that's the beauty of like Excel, you can actually have go and read documents and pull stuff from those documents. That's great. If they are relatively similar, which is yeah. good about what's good about the uh, kinetic forms is that they're all the same. Right. So it can pull all that stuff really right. easily. Right. Anything, any other questions, comments? Was this helpful? Yes. You're going to go tell all your friends to join RAMP? Right. Now. I, yeah. Uh, and I went to Mike with your role and, and uh, the daily gratitude list. Um, I very much recommend it. We do that on a daily basis. I'm pretty dedicated to doing it. It has improved my lifestyle with work and without work. Too. That's just, what you do. It, like this morning, I said, I'm grateful for my mother. She made me sandwiches today. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, just I remembered that and it just yeah. it started my day off well. So That's awesome. I highly recommend it. That's awesome. I do too. Um, so if any of you here are mortgage nerds, because we always have realtors, some realtors are mortgage nerds, I'm doing a mortgage 101 class on Friday, which it looks like it's now going to be Zoom because um, the number of in-house people wanting to come in are, are not enough. But if you're, if you're free, I would recommend it because I'm actually changing that course up from what I usually do. And I'm, I'm going to introduce a couple of strategies that are specific to the market we're in right now that might be helpful to you. Because there's some, we always say in real estate, right? Real estate moves west, moves east. You start to see things in California and then they start coming east. Do you agree? It's like always the way. I don't get it. So slow and stubborn. Yeah. yeah. But there's some, and this is really about market conditions, but there's some strategies we can employ to help clients feel less stressed and less pressured. So if you're free, I think it's at 10 o'clock. Yeah, it's at 10 o'clock. If you're free, you know, sign up for this course. Um, you know, it's never a bad idea to know more about my industry because it impacts your industry so much. Um, and, you know, hopefully you'll, you'll learn something good. Otherwise, uh, I don't have the date of our next class. Um, I'll make sure that we get it out to you guys. You know, definitely. November 16th. <laughs> the sky is it's like the voice of God. November 16th, Rach. November 16th. And which one is that, Rach? David Candelora, investing in real estate. David Candelora. Now, David did this presentation um, previously and it got critically acclaimed, which is why we put it into the RAMP program. So I think you guys will learn a lot from David on November 16th. So good. All right, lunch is here. I'm going to hang around a little bit if you want to, you know, if you have any questions or you want to talk through anything, I'm starving. And um, you've got my information. We have the registration. I'll get all this to you um, later this afternoon. We're case tomorrow morning okay and you're always welcome to call me on anything that we cover all right thank you. thanks guys thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.